Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael David Fox. I'm the director of the Center for Eurasian Russian and European Studies here in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. And it's really a great pleasure to welcome Mikhail Zigar here to Georgetown on the occasion of his recent publication of War and Punishment, Putin, Zelensky, and the Path to Representation of Ukraine. We have a representative of the bookstore here, and the copies of the book are available. I'll do a little signing afterwards. Um, but um, Mikhail Zigar is probably well known to everyone in this room as a journalist who was editor in chief of um, TV Rain, Dost, from 2010, editor in chief from 2010 to 2015. He's a historian, filmmaker, author, and intellectual who is um, going to have a discussion with us for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And then I'm gonna, I know there's gonna be a lot of uh, questions, so I'm gonna open it up after that. But I know this audience will be interested in um, Mikhail, your activities as a journalist and as someone who is sort of pushing the envelope of the possible when you were editor in chief of, of our TV Rain. But but um, my question, I guess, is since then, since it was sort of shut down and phased out after 2015, which is of course a key year in the run up to the current full fledged war in Ukraine, you were doing a lot of um, journalism with inside Russia and the political system, but also in Ukraine. And you mentioned you met as uh, interviewed Zelensky and you spent quite a bit of time uh, in Ukraine writing this book. So my question is, how did your experience as a journalist sort of inform your understanding of both Russian and Ukrainian politics? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you for, for coming. Um, you know, I, um, as a Russian citizen, as a Russian author, I'm very cautious about, uh, um, about this book because I insist that it's not in a way some kind of Ukrainian history. I'm not in a position to write history of Ukraine. So that's that's history of uh, Russia and R Russian empires pressing Ukraine during the, the previous ages. And that's that, that's important for me. And that, that was important um, um, important angle um, which I used uh, as as Russian journalist working in in Ukraine, actually, since uh, 2003, I was I was coming um, first because I I worked as a war correspondent for for one of Russia's leading newspapers called Commerçant, uh, and um, I had to come to the uh, the Orange Revolution, and then uh, to all the uh, street protests, uh, to all consecutive Maidans, and um, had to interview most of uh, Ukrainian. Um, business leaders, political players. And actually, I think yeah, um, uh, probably 2004 was the turning point for, for Russia versus Ukraine, because uh, first of all, it was a turning point for, for President Putin. That was that exact moment when um, when he, his paranoia started, when he allowed himself to be deceived by his spin doctors, by, by his people hired uh, to support presidential campaign of, uh, of candidate Viktor Yanukovych, uh, and they have stole all of the like most of the money allocated to that uh, to that presidential campaign, uh, and kept uh, convincing him that everything was under their control, that the, their candidate was was uh, doomed to win. Uh, after all, when uh, yeah, the Orange Revolution happened and what uh, that opposition candidate the Yushin was victorious uh the only ex explanation uh they could offer him was that it was all about Americans like yeah we did our best but Americans spent much more money Americans invested in uh, the uh, candidate Yushin for much more and that was uh probably Putin might have suspected that uh that was a lie uh, and that's because he but he as he was really uh, sincerely um, offended by that kind of betrayal of Ukrainian people. He was he was touring. He was uh, campaigning as if it was his own campaign. He was 
uh, he was coming to Kiev. Uh, he was uh, giving interviews to Ukrainian TV, TV channels as if he was running for, for Ukrainian presidency. And according to, uh, to many polls, he, by that time, he was probably the most popular politician in Ukraine. But uh, af after all, he was he was so uh, so hurt by by the the victory of the Orange Revolution. So so he decided that the only explanation uh, uh, of of what has happened could be that yes, Ukrainians were just bought by Amer Americans, and there is a huge American uh, conspiracy against him, and he was the next target. He was the next. Um, potential victim of uh, uh, of that uh, row of uh, of color revolutions and that that was actually a turning point for, for Russian politics uh, as for uh, it was uh, very important to turning point for for Ukrainian civil society that that started its um, um, its path of decolonization and 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 now we we see that the current uh, generation of, uh, of uh, Ukrainians and even current current generation of Ukrainian politicians, uh, they do not consider the, themselves to be former Russian colony. Uh, it's in in this book I, I an, analyze all the all the major historical myths uh, which were created by by Russian historians during the last um, with centuries. But at the same time, I a, analyze how those myths were affecting um ukrainians and russian politicians so uh for example it was very easy uh, for putin to to believe that uh ukrainians sold him and they they betrayed him because that that's very archetypical myth of ivan mazepa uh the uh, ukrainian hetman um, and the the myth was was codified by, by alexander pushkin and uh, Poltava is the infamous poem, very, very propagandist uh, poem, probably the, the, the most propagandist poem written by Pushkin. But at, at the same time, uh, in the book, I analyze how all those myths uh, were, uh, were helping uh, the, the, the Ukrainian civil, civil society to, to transform. And a very clear example is President Zelensky, who, um, who before that, who, before 2004, uh, was just just a comedian, was was a showman working for the Russian television. He lived in Moscow, and uh, approximately the same time, 2004, he decided to come back to Kiev, not because of the revolution, not because of, uh, but it was just uh, um, the changes that were happening in, in Ukraine were so obvious. So so that that was his, his volunteer choice to continue his career on Ukrainian television to stop working. Um, um, in Moscow, and yeah, so I actually think I read the book, and I think that that's the most innovative part is that the first half is all these succession of myths, starting with 1654. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing to write about that. But then you show how they kind of took on a life of their own and actually influenced the course of history in the post Soviet years. And so I think that's. But I mean, I guess my question was about you as a journalist, though. I mean, you're dealing with these people, you're interviewing them. Does it? How does it affect you? Like when you see the diverging political cultures, right? You're immersed. You're immersed in both sides. Did you realize how sharply they were diverging, Ukraine and Russia, after say 2011, 2014? Did your journalist get give us a sense of what it was like to be a journalist in those years? I think it would be very interesting for us. You know, I never had an um, an idea that that Russia and Ukraine are similar. Uh, it was the, the, there was some kind of illusion shared by a lot of Russian bureaucrats because uh, reg when they when they were coming regularly uh, to Kiev, uh, the only things they could see was that like everyone was speaking Russian. Uh, was very close to all, the, all those Soviet traditions they uh, uh, they used to see. So, so for them, there was no difference. Um, I never shared that that illusion. For, them, for me, it was completely different. Uh, even though I started uh, 
um, I started w working at, as a journalist in before Christ in Yeltsin's period, um, <laughs> so it's a very long time ago. But still, the the atmosphere in uh, in Russia was completely uh, completely different. Even though um, I would say that the first ten years of of, of Putin's presidency in terms of of freedom of speech were not that disastrous as. Um, as they were considered to be by by many, so uh, I remember that uh, every, every time when I was asked, um, even probably till till two thousand fourteen, when I was asked by by foreign correspondents, uh, why aren't you afraid of being killed? Why are you still working as a journalist? Is, is it so dangerous to be a journalist in Russia? Uh, my my ans my usual answer was uh it's hard but not but not dangerous it's equally dangerous to be a journalist or a plumber because like th yeah th there is a risk that you might be arrested on the street uh and uh, the the policemen uh, decide to torture you to death and th th there is equal opportunity for for any citizen of russia because for many years um uh, russian police acted like the uh, the worst terrorist organization uh, in the country. Um, but speaking speaking about journalism, it was um, it was hard because uh, there was only one condition. Uh, the, uh, you had the possibility to work as an independent journalist, but you you must have known that your media uh, will never be successful. You won't be able to, to earn money. You won't be able to have commercial partners, no advertising. You you have to be miserable, and that's the price to pay for being independent. And for many years, that was, um, in the beginning, um, I was working for, for Color Sun, which was a prosperous new, newspaper, and then, then it was uh, it was destroyed after it was bought by uh, the Sheriff's Monarch. I, I left it just in a couple of months after, after that. Then we were, uh, we have created, um, TV Rain, that was a prosperous TV channel that uh, that was covering everything in, in Ukraine, and uh, that that was covering protests of um, of uh, 2014. And uh, just for me, it was very important to show to our Russian audience um, how Ukrainian democracy was functioning, and we we deliberately were were showing life. Um, uh, a lot of discussions in um, in the Home Rada, in the Ukrainian Parliament, with simultaneous translation to Russian. Uh, uh, we considered it to be some kind of, of a lesson of democracy because we we could not show any discussion in uh, in Russian state Duma because there were it was not a place for discussion. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it seemed uh, to us very. Um, important and very symbolic to show that that example that uh such level of uh, of debate is still possible mm -hmm. and we see a uh, uh, um, country that is culturally very close to us but they have completely different political culture and and that was um uh some some kind of mission for us and actually it was fatal because uh our coverage of uh um, of uh, so-called revolution of dignity, uh, all those Euromaidan protests, they they actually led to the destruction of our TV channel, to all the all the sanctions uh, uh, that were implemented against the TV channel. Just uh, and it was not a coincidence that our TV channel was uh, almost destroyed uh, a few weeks before occupation of Crimea. Um, it's interesting what you've said about the Russian officials and bureaucrats going to Ukraine and seeing what they wanted to see, in a sense, because I remember during the Maidan uh, revolution, the big protests, I heard this very often in Russia, that these people were just paid to go out on the streets. And so there's a kind of projection of your own system onto the other one. But I guess my question is also is about the audience for this book by demolishing these myths. I guess, are you hoping that this will be a, a Russian audience that will learn from it? But you clearly have a Ukrainian audience because you mentioned that you wrote much of this, some of it in, in Bucha with your uh, Ukrainian friend, Nadia, 
who then wouldn't speak to you because you're Russian, therefore imperialist, and you write in your introduction, this Nadia, this proves that I'm not an imperialist. I'm not quoting you exactly, but that's the sense uh, of the introduction. And so clearly there's a kind of attempt to reach certain people in Ukraine. So I guess, what's the audience of that mission of the book? Who, who do you want to persuade, I guess? Well, actually, I, I must uh, start with the fact that I've um, I've started writing this book in 2021, before the war. Mm -hmm. uh, in summer 2021, I uh, I met uh, President Zelensky and uh, a lot of people in, in Kiev. I was traveling to Kiev and in Kharkiv and um, Lviv and Odessa and uh, a lot of places in Ukraine because I had that idea to write about Ukraine as uh, as a phenomenon, as the uh, the post-Soviet country that that has its um, clear different uh, scenario of uh, post-Soviet development, and that, that that is so different from uh, from Russia. And uh, for example, uh, probably because in Russia there is still communist generation in power, and in Ukraine we had first communist generation represented by uh, two first presidents, then Komsomol generation. Uh, and now, absolutely non soviet gen generation of those in power, and that that seemed to be uh, quite um, quite a phenomena of the birth of, of the the society of the of the nation. Um, and I had to change my my approach to that book uh, absolutely when uh, the, the full scale invasion started um, on the twenty fourth of October of February. Um, I realized that. That it should it should be completely different book, and uh, it should be partially about my. It should not be about Ukraine, but it should be about Russia. Uh, it should be about what 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 Russia has done, and about ourselves, about uh, about everything we we did notice, everything we were blind to see, and I uh, was um, for me that's very important to start. A certain uh, conversation in Russian society, because after after the the, the, the beginning of the full scale aggression, uh, we've heard a lot uh, of criticism from Ukrainian side, not against Putin, but against Russian culture, Russian uh, literature, um, and it was very important for me to address that issue, to 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 think if it's justified or not, and if. Uh, if I am to blame or or I'm innocent, and it was it was very clear for me that we need to to embrace that the fact that that yes we are guilty, and I um, I kept thinking uh, about um, all the previous times I was speaking to my Ukrainian uh, friends, um, to my to the Ukrainian journalists, and we 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 used to have. Fights. We used to have a uh, lot, lot of emotional debates about our past, about Russian language, about the rights of Russian-speaking minority, and um, it seems that that I didn't understand a lot. I was, uh, as many Russians still are, um, I was very indifferent to their arguments. I didn't see a lot of things that they were trying to explain me. Um, I was watching that history through the traditional uh, lens of uh, of Russian imperial narrative, and unfortunately, we don't have any other historical narrative except for, for Russian imperial narrative. We don't have any other Russian history apart from written through the eyes of uh, uh, Russian emperors. So, um, uh, most of uh, previous classical. Uh, Russian historians, including um, Karamzin, and the, mo most of them who worked before him, and most of them who worked after him, they they worked for the government. Karamzin was official historiographer of the Alexander the First, and he 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 wrote his his history of Russian state. Uh, actually, it was designed to be a piece of propaganda. He it was designed to explain why why all the peoples, all the ethnicities. Uh, uh, of the Russian Empire, Ukrainians and Belarusians and Tatars and Buryats, um, all, all of them, why they 
spent the centuries of the life of like all the generations lived only for the sake of the happy moment when they uh, became the servants of Alexander the first and that's the way how Russian history has always been designed and that's the uh, that's the history uh, Putin believes in and unfortunately that's the history we we used to believe in and we we have never tried to to watch um, uh, to, to have a look at our past through the eyes of Ukrainians through the eyes of Belarus Belarusians Kazakhs um, uh, there's a lot of ferment going on among professional yeah. historians yeah. as well, but uh, it's interesting when you raise the question of complicity, right? There's no sort of accepting responsibility. It's I was about to ask you about the new diaspora, but I remember right after the war broke out, I was on all these telegram channels reading very inter interesting commentaries among Russian intellectuals who are talk raising this issue of complicity and making analogies with, say, the, the Germans who were after the Nazi period. And there was a very, very interesting discussion. And now you are part, I mean, we met in Berlin, you know, the crossroads of this new uh, journalists and oppositionists and all, all sorts of uh, exiles um, who are now scattered around the periphery of Russia and other parts of the world. So you're part of this new diaspora that's sort of in, in it's, at least it's intellectual when grappling with these questions. And, you know, I just, I, I guess, what are your thoughts on this huge number of talented people who are now living abroad in the interwar period? A lot of them ended up, uh, Russian emigres ended up driving taxis, but is, is this new diaspora going to suffer the same fate or is there other perspectives now? Mm. If we speak about the economic side of, of, uh, of this tragedy, of, it's not a tragedy, uh, it's just like, um, yeah, if, if, if we're talking about Russian diaspora, uh, we are much more privileged than Ukrainian diaspora. We are much more privileged than Russian immigrants uh, um, who lived 100 years ago. Because, yeah, we are much more integrated. We are, there was the internet that has prepared us for, for being integrated in, into the global community. So I not, I'm not that, um, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard for, for a lot of people because they, they, um, because mentally they are still there. I think that's, that's the, the, the worst part of it. That a lot of people had made that uh grave decision uh to leave not because they were in danger not because they they were afraid of mobilization but like well half a million people left right in in february and march um and it's it's very it's very hard for them it was very hard to find new places uh it's very hard for for a lot of them right now because they moved to israel or they have Israeli passports, and now they they have uh, some kind of, of if not deja vu, but they they have uh, new 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 problems. Uh, but but a lot of them mentally are stuck in Russia. A lot of them mentally are stuck in the um, partially in the same approach they used to have. I I don't know, for example, what's what's going to be the reception uh, of my book and how how Russian society is uh, how how that diaspora society of uh, of the Russia outside of Russia uh, is going to uh, to ex uh, to approach the, this book because I think that it's going to be very polarized. Uh, the idea of um, of Russia as a brutal colonial empire is still not acceptable for a lot of people because according to Russian tradition, Russia is not a colonial empire. We have recently heard that uh, that, that Putin uh, uh, had a brilliant, uh, sarcastic uh, lecture about history at Valdai Forum when, when he was uh, lecturing about Russia, not a colonial empire, but all the nations voluntarily wanted to become integral part of, of Mother Russia. And uh, Russia has always helped other nations, not suppressed them. Uh, but that's that's the way how a lot of people uh, um, believe. 
So it's it's for many for many Russians outside of Russia, even outside of Russia, it's going to be very very long way uh, to to change their perception, as well as uh, for for many. I I don't think that that Russians inside the country are are uh, all of them support uh, the war. I think that there is a demand for that conversation and and people are mm, are really expecting uh, the, the, that kind of, of conversation. Although uh, the, the polarization is going to be huge, I don't know if uh, if I'm going to be accused of um, uh, some criminal, uh, probably yes, but who knows. But uh, I think that the important, the key, the key point to answer your question is that there is a one question everyone uh, used to ask, at least last year, uh, are we going to, to be back? Is there a possibility? And when, when are, are we going to be back? Are we going to be back uh, when Putin dies? Or there are different um, conditions. Uh, and we, we, still, we still don't know the answer. And the longer uh, the war continues, the, uh, the more international crisis uh, we witness, I think it's, it's clear that uh, we still don't know uh, if the war is going to, uh, to continue for 10 years or for five years or, or even more. Yeah, I, I'm sure that it depends on, on the life expectancy, of Putin's uh, <laughs> life expectancy. Uh, and, you know, we are going to be very different people by, by that time. So I think that the uh, the transformation that the moral transformation that started within uh, within Russian society inside Russia and outside of Russia has just started, and we are going to to live through uh, um, a lot of changes. Not not because of the war, but also because of the Middle Eastern crisis and a lot of like, the huge World War Three we are in. Well, you know, this is a reminder of the old anecdote to paraphrase that this is one time when the future is even more unpredictable than the past in, mm -hmm. in Russia. But um, uh, one last question before I open it up to uh, the audience. Um, this book ranges over so much material, 350 years of historical myth-making, but also the last 30 years so it's it's almost like a kaleidoscope of of events and figures. In your view, what's the most original material in there that you didn't see in other places? Because you're synthesizing a lot of knowledge, but you're also presenting your own. Mm. You know, I think that that I uh, I managed to to find the sources of uh, of Putin's inner knowledge and inner uh, stereotypes about Ukraine. Uh, why why he thinks that he knows everything and he doesn't need any um, intelligence he doesn't need uh, any advice because he knows it from uh, from the beginning he had very uh, influential teachers he had um, um, when I was uh, uh, when, when I was uh, researching about uh, the the 90s and the people he used to uh, to talk to most of all. Uh, it's it's very easy to, uh, to to come across Kovalchuk brothers, and uh, one one of them is still probably the most influential person in Russia. Yuri Kovalchuk is the only Russian, the only real Russian oligarch, the only Russian businessman who's got a lot of influence uh, on Vladimir Putin, and actually he is the the, the man Vladimir Putin spent uh, a lockdown with uh, in his Valdai residency. Um, so, uh, and it's very important that that Kovalchuk brothers uh, were they they have become very close friends of Putin when when he came back from uh, from Germany, as well as Fursenko brothers, um, um, two very um, intellectual families. Kovalchuk senior was the the Soviet historian and and Fursenko senior uh, also was a Soviet, a Soviet historian. Both of them were academicians, members of Soviet uh, Academy of Sciences, and uh, 
but it was not from a professorial family. He and he he wanted he he adored uh, both fathers. Uh, his father was not an academician. Um, so so th those two academicians were really important father figures for him, uh, and the specialization of Kovalchuk Sinner was Crimean Sevastopol. Uh, the specialization of uh, the Forsenka the Sinner was United States of America and the CIA bluffs against Soviet Union. Um, um, so yeah, he, and. For example, in, in 2014, when a lot of people in Russia were wondering why, why Crimea is uh, a sacred cradle of Russian civilization, no one, no one has ever heard of that. There was no such mythology uh, in Russian society. No one believed in that. But probably there were some people who, who believed in that. And I, I, I'm I sure that academician Kovalchuk is the person, is the unique person who, who had that that approach to um, to uh, Crimean history, but even more um, important or even more ridiculous uh, fact in uh, in Putin's prejudice against Ukraine, uh, I found even in his childhood. Yes, uh, for for today's propaganda, the word Banderites and Stepan Bandera is is very important. Um, everyone knows. No, no, a lot of people don't know. Uh, who is Bandera? And uh, uh, there was a uh, hilarious viral video uh, recently when when a journalist in uh, in Russia was showing to different people a uh, portrait of Stepan Bandera, and most of them uh, responded that that, that that is Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. um, uh, because yeah, they they have something in common. Uh, but um, and it's it's also not um, not so something completely new that. Actually, Banderites existed even before Bandera, but they they, they, they were called Petlorites mm -hmm. uh, in in the first uh, part of the, of the twentieth century. Before that, uh, they were Mazepites uh, uh, because of Ivan Mazepa. But uh, what was the source of Putin's inner knowledge uh, about Banderites and Bandera? How did he first uh, hear that name? It's very uh, interesting because that was from the detective novel. He uh, he was a huge fan of Yulian Simeona. I'm not sure if uh, if everyone uh, knows that name, but that was the most popular um, uh, crime story uh, novelist in Soviet Union. He was uh, Jan Fleming and John Le Carre and John Grisham all together. The most the most popular guy. Uh, and he he created Stilitz, uh, who was the yeah. the most popular uh, character. He was a spy who was spying on on uh, Nazi Germany. His real name was Maxim Isaev, and he was and uh, there was a series, uh, Seventeen Moments of Spring, a uh, legendary Soviet spy uh, spy series. Um, everyone loved it, and it was a personal inspiration for Putin. And he he described it in many of his interviews. And he decided to become a spy. He he wanted uh, to, to to go to apply for a job in the KGB after watching Seventeen uh, Moments of Spring. But uh, for such an ardent fan, obviously it was very important to uh, to to read all the all, all the books and like the 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 next. Uh, novel published by Yulia Sigonov about the same character was was called The Third Card, and that was uh, the novel when Stirlitz was fighting against Bandera. And Bandera was the main villain. And if we if we read how Yulia Sigonov mm -hmm. describes Bandera, it's, it's literally he quotes the uh, uh, today uh, today's propaganda, Vladimir's or obviously vice versa. Vladimir Solovyov and Margaret Simonian and all the rest are just literally reading from from that book. So it's very clear. So if you if you are born and raised uh, uh, in Soviet Union and you get your your information uh, from from the the, the spy novels, uh, you know from the beginning that that the worst Nazi in uh, in human history, the worst Nazis are Ukrainian nationalists and Stepan Bandera is, is, the, is the villain. So yeah, that's-, well, that's... You know, um, when, that was a very interesting answer for me because when I read the book, the parts about Kavalchuk and Semyonov, I was reading them, I was like, I have not seen that 
elsewhere before. So I'm glad my instincts as a Russia watcher or Kremlinologist were, were not off. Um, but let's open the floor to questions. And uh, I know there will be uh, a number. So just identify yourself before you speak. Thank you so much, Mikhail. My name is Torgan Pitikin, and I work for the Russia Foundation. And due to my work, I, I work a lot with journalists who are still in Russia and try to do any kind of independent journalism in Russia. And the question I receive a lot from them when I work for Putin Progress with them, which I'm happy to speak as you about later, as you mentioned, have a few minutes, is that how can we work in Russia and be independent and stick to the journalism principles we have chosen when we decided to become journalists? Is that the question I would like to readdress to you? I think that that you were that the, the people who you, you you're working with already practice the answer to, to this question. They they know how to do it because I uh, that we know that a lot of journalists are trying are working uh, in Russia. And uh, although the, the, there is a stereotype that the, the journalism is dead in Russia and all the independent uh, journalists have left, that's not that's obviously not true. Because we we get a lot of information from the country, thanks to all those people. Uh, and yes, there is no Gazeta that is an outstanding example. Uh, they were stripped of their license. Uh, but it's it's very funny how uh, how you can um, don't pay attention to the the Russian laws because yes, according to Russian law, you cannot be a journalist. You cannot print the newspaper without a license. But uh, no one. Um, uh, bans you from uh, it's not prohibited to be a blogger you can't have the website and you don't have uh, to have a license for, for making uh, a website any um, any restaurant or any um, uh, I don't know any factory has uh, so so they are uh, like 50 people who used to work for Nova Gazeta and who stayed in country, they are pro uh, producing their website, they are they're making their U U YouTube channel. And that's like uh, uh, so-called federal media. They are working in Moscow and they are making um, very high quality journalism. Uh, they don't call the war a war. Yeah, they, they, they have to use uh, that that presidology, uh, especially military operation, but um, behind them, and what's more important, we've got a lot of uh, little independent regional local websites. We've got local websites in Moscow and St. Petersburg and in Voronezh in uh, in Yekaterinburg in everywhere. A lot of uh, young people who actually, if they work for a local website. Probably they don't want to work for Vegeterka for, 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 for Russian state-owned television. Uh, they prefer um, to be more to be decent journalists and to earn a little rather than to work for, for state-owned television and, and earn a lot. Uh, and we we learn a lot from all those websites. They don't write about the war. They cannot do that. That's the the um, natural limitation but all the information about about the protests all the information about um wagner group uh, uh veterans coming back and murdering the, their families all the all the information from from the the villages and, and and little cities we we know that we know quite a lot about what's really happening in russia thanks to those um uh, regional websites and they they are working and they they are actually our um, eyes and ears in Russia and all the independent media, um, including Medusa and, uh, or TV Rain, they report about what's happening in Russia only thanks to, uh, to those um, independent little websites. Marjorie. Um, Marjorie Mandelstam Balzer, Georgetown. Um, I'm an uh, anthropologist and I'm fascinated by your approach with the mythology um, and blowing various myths. And the question I have comes to something that has become something of a myth. I understand that you have spent real time in Bucha, um, and there's a part of your book that does reference the 
ironies of having been colonized themselves and maybe Buryat contract soldiers who are actually in Bucha. And so I wanted to have you give us an insight into how you got information about what had become by reputation an atrocity, but has since been discredited. It turns out that it wasn't Buryat's yeah, after yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a there's a there's a really tricky thing going in here because it has to do with stereotypes of all the non-Russians inside of Russia. In other words, I'm not just trying to single out one atrocity and nip it its reputation. It, I'm trying to try to understand how this has come about that the non-Russians were so easily uh, attributed to having committed those atrocities. What are your insights into that and what is your data? Yeah, uh, ob obviously, and it's, it's, very, it's very, it's necessary to, to highlight that, that that was, uh, that was a proven mistake. It was, uh, uh, it was something Ukrainian society and Ukrainian media uh, sincerely believed and uh, Ukrainian journalists were, were writing and reporting about uh, who are sol soldiers uh, who were staying in Bucha and that proved th that is proven to be wrong. So we, we, we've got a lot of uh, proofs that uh, the, the majority of those soldiers who stayed in, in Bucha were from Pskov. Uh, they, they were they were not they were not from Buryatia and so that was the, the initial uh, mistake of uh, Ukrainian journalists and it's it, it needs to be clear and it's 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 very important uh, to raise that, that issue uh, it's um, um another question we we've got why um, um why a lot of uh, a lot of ethnicities uh, are frequently stigmatized and are blamed for for so-called national character that's uh that's i think that the consequence of the uh traditional uh, imperialist imperialist narrative that's the consequence of the fact that we 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 have never been watching uh to russian history through and we we have never been writing the history of uh, of those peoples of uh, of those uh, nations we have never um consider them to be um uh, cultures that were colonized by by russian cossacks approximately the same time as north america was colonized by uh by the english uh and actually it's a, it's very legitimate parallel uh and definitely we we are just in the beginning of uh uh of trying and th that that's uh, I'm sure that that uh, I will have to, to spend a lot of years to try to write um, one of my ne next books uh, uh, devoted to that non-imperialist uh, uh, historical narrative of Russia with special attention to different uh, peoples of Russia, like uh, because um, peoples of, of, of Siberia, uh, peoples of uh, Caucasus, uh, peoples of um, uh, Eastern Europe and Far East deserve their uh, place in uh, in Russian history. Uh, that is not Moscow centered, and it's only Moscow centered uh, hi history uh, clears and glorifies all the victories of uh, the Great Russian uh, Empire and vilifies uh, different ethnicities. That's that's uh, uh, our historic mistake that that needs to be uh, corrected obviously and uh, and obviously yeah uh, the word great that is uh, so loved by uh, by russian historians and russian intelligence it needs to be dropped so we 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 need to to say russian literature without uh, any um uh, adjectives in the russian language thank you uh i'm harley balzer uh now retired i was the first director of the series and my question uh, i'm working with 13 colleagues to but I have a volume that we're calling I failure. Right in the middle of the oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know what I say. I want to do that. <laughs> Trying to decide. Uh, <laughs> failure rush under Putin. And we agree on almost everything, but one of the places that we've been having a big fight is reconciling all of the corruption, especially in the military, 
in science, um, in places where you wouldn't expect it from somebody who's trying to make Russia great again, with Putin's effort to make Russia great again. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that at all. Um, it meant he was not sincere in the, uh, in his attempts to make Russia great again. Yeah, he was not. Uh, and actually, we 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 know exactly the moment when when he um, he embraced that that approach. Uh, he he was not that was not he, his rhetoric before the protests of uh, 2011 2012. Uh, it was um, before that the the the, the Sulkov's ideology was was about the the uh, pro Western development and the like middle class in Russian capitalism. Um, it was it was not um, about about the Russian jingoism, and uh, and yes, he, he was per, uh, Putin was personally offended by uh, by the treacherous betrayal of Russian people of Russian middle class. Uh, he expected them to be be very loyal and very thankful for the most prosperous decade in Russian history uh, that happened due, due to high oil prices, not because of him, but he believed that because of him. And yeah, and he he just changed his 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 he changed his ideological advisor. Uh, he dropped Sulkov and and hired Volodin exactly the same moment. And it was Volodin uh, who who offered him the the, the new approach, uh, not not to care anymore about middle class, not to care about intellectuals, and to try to appeal to to those people who want uh, to 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 see Russia great again. Who, uh, he he has changed the audience he he was talking to, um, and now I I must say that uh, we are witnessing the moment when when he's changing the audience uh, for the second time. Now it looks like uh, he has come he's coming or he has come to the conclusion that actually he doesn't need the population at all. So actually, he doesn't care about what mm -hmm. what people really think, because uh, actually, security apparatus is enough. So it's enough to to have very loyal army, uh, national guard, and and the, and the police, and um, and it's okay if the majority of of the population do do not support the war. They are if they are just afraid and silent, th that's okay. And uh, it's enough to to keep the the the, uh, the state more or less stable. And so, and we see that it's uh, it's it's very funny that uh, the most uh, like uh, most efforts of Russian propaganda are right now uh, um, uh, directed not uh, inside the country, not domestically, but internationally. He, uh, it looks like Russian propaganda cares much more about uh, its uh, image in the global south. It has become much more uh, like all the appeals to the conservative values, for example. They are, they look really weird in Russia. No one like val family values. Uh, what uh, is it, President Putin, who who's got? Uh, semi-official mistress and who knows how many uh kids uh like he's uh, he's preaching about traditional family values or russian parliament uh voting for their uh, law against transgender people who cares about transgender people in russia uh it's only uh, uh designed to to appeal to the uh, American conservative uh, groups uh, and like the the only place on earth where uh, the slogan um, uh, trans lives matter exists as United States that was the law um, introduced this summer only for American consumption not for not, not for domestic so it's like we we are in the third phase of, of Putin's uh, ideology and it's the most weird one Okay, we still have about 10 minutes for questions, so I know that our students have them. I encourage you to ask them, but for now, I, I saw first uh, one of our faculty members. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and in relation to this nice book and interesting comments, um, in the book, mostly about the present and the past, about myths 
Uh, and but you made some remarks already that there are, you see some changes in Russia. So my question is about future. So uh, some observers here see Putin not only as a gap, ghost of the past and parallel Russia, but also as a ghost of the future. What do you think about this? Mm. You know, it's very hard to uh, uh, it was very easy to make uh, uh, predictions uh, when we were shocked by the beginning of the, uh, the invasion in Ukraine. And like last March and um, last April, um, most of us, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about Russian immigrants mostly, most of us were brave enough to make very bold predictions. And we were, I remember uh, sitting uh, uh, in the kitchen in Berlin with uh, with several prominent Russian uh, editors in chief or journalists, and we were making bets uh, about when we're going to stop. And uh, the most optimistic one was uh, this July. So that was July 2022. Uh, and like the, the, the most pessimistic was uh, in 15 years. Um, I think, uh, but you know, I think our, our approach is changing and has changed a number of times. And our forecasts, uh, I remember that uh, I was really impressed by what was happening within Wagner Group and uh, with uh, with Yevgeny Prigozhin. And uh, uh, last winter in January, I wrote uh, an op-ed for the New York Times uh, about uh, the growing power uh, popularity of Yevgeny Prigozhin and, and that he was the person that might have challenged and might might have like ruined Russia's stability. And I remember that that um, the the reception from the the Russia what Russia's watchers community was very mixed. I've I've heard a lot of criticism and a lot of laughters uh, from from uh, specialists and were saying, "What precaution can challenge Putin?" Then when uh, the, the mutiny started, uh, a lot of people changed their uh, their approach, and the next day. Everything, uh, everyone changed their so, uh, approach uh, at the same time. So we were, uh, we thought very much about Prigor, then <laughs> we stopped. Uh, so you know, we we don't know uh, how um, where that Russia would be the moment when when he dies. So it's it's very important because uh, because the pattern of uh, of the population of Russia is changing. We we still see that the majority of Russian population are um, under the bed. They are hiding. They just they don't want to watch the news. You know my 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 favorite image, uh, my my favorite symbol of uh, of Russia today is Chiburashka. Uh, you you have probably heard about that uh, uh, that movie. That's a record breaking movie. That's the most popular. Uh, movie that has ever been shown in Russian cinema theaters, bypassing Avatar or anything that that has ever been produced globally, uh, it's um, it uh, it has been um, premiered this uh, new year, and that's that's the most popular, and it's it shows uh, what what Russians feel. Chiburashka, if if someone does know, that's a nostalgic uh, cartoon hero from. From the Soviet years, like and like in, in Hollywood, uh, there are movies based on cartoons. Like Little Mermaid used to be a cartoon, and now it's a it's a movie. There used to be a cartoon about Chaburashka, and now it's a movie about Chaburashka. But if everyone in in this country uh, goes and watches Chaburashka, that means that they they want to be children again. They want mom to come back and to hug them and just to. Uh, they 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 are so scared of this uh, uh, reality of being of being adults of being grown. They they don't want to decide anything. They don't want to choose. They don't want to to support the war or to protest against the war. Just they they are just scared. 
uh, and that's that's very um, that's the atmosphere that is going to last for for several years. I'm not sure that that is going to last for forever. Uh, I don't. I sincerely do not believe in the uh, if uh, if let's say not regime collapse. If Putin dies within several years, I do not believe in the the huge civil war inside Russia uh, because to have the civil war, you need like like in in 1918, you need to have a lot of people. Uh, who have nothing to lose except for their chains, as, as Le Lenin taught. Uh, and at the same time, you need to have groups of people who strongly believe in something, mm -hmm. who strongly believe in the communism or in the um, great Russian Empire and Emperor Nicholas II. Uh, you, you, you need to have whites and reds to fight, fight against each other. We don't have we don't have those groups in Russia. We don't have we we see Russia that that does not believe in anything. We like the, people are not willing to sacrifice themselves for the sake of anything. Yeah, they uh, Russia today is very cynical country because uh, because they they have um, uh, lived through a lot of uh, disillusionments. They were. Uh, some of them believed in communism, and then overnight they were said, they were told, forget it, it was bullshit. Then they were uh, the, the same happened with democracy, with with ever, everything actually. So yeah, pe people are really cynical. They are not able. They are not willing to fight uh, to sacrifice anything. There are there are no regional elites willing to to start the, the internal struggle because they have a lot to lose. Any compromise between them is bad, is more uh, beneficial than, than any war. So I think that for, for now, uh, the status quo um, is, is like, that's a terrible Putinist status quo, but it, it's uh, it's desired by, by most people in, in Russia. So the moment when, when he departs, uh, um, uh, comrades uh, Malinkov, Khrushchev, and uh, and Bulganin, um, and Voroshilov are probably would figure it out, uh, literally. And it's uh, probably the 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 aggression against Ukraine can start that can stop that day, but it won't affect the the. The new Cold War, so nothing, nothing would change. But that's the that's the percep that's my perception uh, of Russia's future for today. Because I think that um, I I was thinking of it a uh, couple of weeks ago. Probably it's already outdated because uh, because of the Middle Eastern crisis, mm -hmm. a lot uh, like our approach has has to change we just we, we don't understand how it's going to affect um everything we are discussing right now uh obviously for for america the war in ukraine is over uh because it's like overshadowed by uh, by much greater war in the middle east uh and how, how the situation in ukraine and russia is going to be affected by by the middle east crisis we we we're we're still um we have to to absorb it, to, to understand it. We have time for one more question. I saw Anna's hand up. And then we'll take two questions, Anna and then Daria, but very briefly, because we're a little over time. So. Thank you so much for such a thought provoking discussion. I'm Anna Smelo, PhD candidate at the History Department here. And I was really interested in what you said about realizing about yourself that. Uh, um, to the public intellectual, your position was somehow shaped or affected uh, with Moscow-centered imperialist vision of history and being Russian citizen my, myself, writing dissertation about, you know, imperialism and decolonizing Russia, my question is, might be semi-philosophical. How do we, what should we do? Like, what is the instrumentary for decolonizing our narratives, our position? And maybe how, how do you think the post-war uh, public discussions might look like to overcome, like, or to emphasize the sense of guilt uh, that we have to work on? It would be like anything 
uh, as post-war Germany. Um, what, what, what will the discussion looking like after the war? Do you mind taking a few questions? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, my name is Darina. I come from Kazakhstan. I'm a serious fellow here. My question is uh, more about narratives and especially a Russophobia narrative in Russia. I was in Kazakhstan this summer talking to Russian, ethnic Russian people who migrated to Kazakhstan after the death of the war. I was asking about this idea of Russophobia and a lot of people actually told me that uh, it is a present idea of like they would hear from people, not only in like media, but also from close people, older people that like don't go to that country. It's very Russophobic. Like, they don't really, really like Russians. So, and we saw a lot of that, especially at the start of the war, like this idea from the inside of Russia that everybody is Russophobic. Yeah, so what is the, like, what are the implications of that? And is it actually from your observations in Russia as Russian citizens, is it actually the case in Russia? Um, let me start with, with your question, because I think it's, it's, um, it's easy. It's, it's short to answer. I think that that's traditional propagandist method, and that's like um, a lot of authoritarian uh, regimes in the world use it. Uh, they create the image that like everybody hates you. The only place where you can live is your own country, because like the world hates you. Don't go there. They are our enemies just because they hate you. <laughs> there is no ex there is no reason just because they they are envious. They are worse than you. You are the 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 center of the the global spirituality. You are the one the the, the people everyone wants to be, but they cannot be us. That's why they hate us. It's like it's very it's very primitive and but that's the, that's the way how. Uh, that's the, the, the narrative Russian propaganda has during the last 10 years, actually. It started in, um, in, in 2012. Uh, and uh, it's, it's easier to believe um, for, for many people uh, than, for example, uh, to believe that, uh, that Ukrainians are Nazis and it's, uh, it's needed to, um, to denazify Ukraine. So and that, that propaganda slogan was dropped immediately after the beginning of the war because like first no one could uh no russian bureaucrat could pronounce denazification it's very long uh and that, that, that there was one uh, uh hilarious case when when a far in the far east the mayor of the city was um speaking at the rally and he was trying to say denazification and he couldn't and he he did it uh from the fourth attempt but he was so confused so he said denazification of russia uh, um, so yeah, uh, but um, the 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 myth of uh, of uh, Russia surrounded by by Russophobes that's uh, that's something that 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 is needed to um, instead of um, the Iron Curtain, and it's even better because like really we don't like Putin did not create any uh, in any kind of Iron Curtain. Uh, there is some kind of Iron Curtain between Russia and Europe, and it's erected by Europe. And he's just creating that uh, th that idea that it's much better here mm -hmm. than outside of Russia. And your question is, uh, th thank you for your questions. And your question is very complicated because um, um, we don't need to, we don't have to compare first Russia with, with Germany because nothing uh, is going to be repeated. Uh, at the same time, we uh, probably the, the only uh, the only lesson that we we should use from from Germany is that we we know that German denazification was not successful. Uh, if, if any German uh, would tell you uh, like if, uh, um, while living in Berlin, I was talking to to a lot of people about their uh, grandfathers and. I've heard the phrase, but grandfather was Nazi till the end, like dozens of times. So um, the, the generation of, uh, um, of grandfathers was not denazified. We know that the real denazification happened only with the next generation, and it happened in, in 1972, uh, thanks to Meryl Streep and uh, the, the, the serious Holocaust. That was shown on German television, and that was uh, mind-blowing 
um, uh, for 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 many Germans, and it was pro pro probably the, uh, the the first time when when the real uh, con uh, conversation in German society started. It was not possible in uh, in forties and fifties. It was it was really possible in seventies. So so we need uh, we need several decades of uh, uh, of preparation for 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 that conversation. We need to to stop uh, uh yeah pr probably we we we, we need uh, a lot of new works uh of about about history of peoples of russia uh about people of russia uh we we need to stop focusing on um russian emperors so we need on on russian on, on history of violence uh but um probably uh, definitely there there are examples there is uh, uh, a, lo a lovely story about Prime Minister Vite, who who had to persuade uh, uh, Emperor Nicholas II, who didn't want to sign the the manifesto of the, the 17th uh, of October, uh, because he doubt he didn't want the constitution, and Vite had to persuade him, and he 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 wrote an essay about uh, about freedom and autocracy, and uh, he proved somehow with, with uh, that essay that history of Russia is history of people fighting for their freedom. And, uh, and he, his idea was that you know, actually autocracy is only three centuries uh, old and fighting for freedom, that was the real history of Russia like from the beginning. And it's a natural, um, it's a natural um, uh, situation when, when people are trying to be free. Uh, unlike uh, trying to um, to be the the loyal servants of of the emperor, so probably uh, it is possible to find other angles um, for for Russian history as well as uh, we uh, once uh, achieved that. We 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 can achieve that as well. I hope. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking you. Please take your copy in the back and we'll stick around for a book signing for those of you who have the book.